I don't think anybody could go through that experience and forget it or not be marked by it in some way. It just showed itself during that strike how solid people can be. I mean, the pressures on people to go back to work were quite immense. When the British establishment is out to get somebody by Christ, they, they go out big time. I still remain bitter to this day because of the way that the miners were treated. I'll never ever forget the hardship, the poverty, and indeed the pain. The trauma of it all really, really did affect people. Marriages broke up. A lot of people suffered bad health problems during and after the strike. The human casualties toll hasn't been really spoken about. The settlement of this dispute is simple. Take away the closures. Sit down and discuss an expanding mining industry. Give job guarantees to my young miners. The miners have always been at the forefront of any struggle to get better conditions, better wages. And then UM in particular tried to unite people with a common cause to work for the benefit of each other in every aspect of life. It was about retaining the communities, it was retaining the fighting for the right to work, fighting for the kids' right to work. If the pit closure programme went ahead, we knew what was going to happen to our communities. I just wanted to protect the people that I loved. You know, the people that I lived with, the people that I respected, and we could understand what was going to happen. The Tories never forgave the miners in the first place for the 1979 or the 1974 or the 1972 setbacks when the miners stood up against them. They never forgave us for that and they were determined through Thatcher and her forces that they were going to destroy the miners union, the mining industry and the miners. Where there is discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error, May we bring truth. Thatcher, she wasn't long in power. What did she do? She appointed Ian McGregor, who had destroyed the steel industry over in America. We have to, in this business, face the realities of adjusting to the markets we have. Ah, uh, we're no different than any other business. She appointed him to be the chairman of the coal board. Now, if this wasn't an incitement towards the miners and their families and the mining industry, then what was? A man who sacrificed 100,000 jobs in the steel industry. As far as I'm concerned, all of us here in the movement should be saying with one almighty voice, but that job is not yours to sell. We didn't want a strike. We felt we were forced into this strike. We're fighting for our futures, we're fighting for our jobs. So, as you can understand, it was pretty chaotic at the start. It's an official strike, but unfortunately, some of the lads who've gone through that picket line today still don't believe that there's an official strike taking place. But as time goes on, I'm quite sure by the end of this week, or even tomorrow or the next day, the men in Wilson Glen will just be as solid as they are elsewhere. I think, yes, I think the, Scottish so will, the Scottish Goldfield will be standing before Wednesday. Yes, Do you think there'll be any ill feeling because these men have crossed the At the beginning the there'll be ill feeling, but later on it'll work itself out. The miners genuinely felt that they had had enough and had been cornered into a position where the only weapon we had to defend us was strike action. I don't think we really knew what we were getting into 
until maybe a month into the strike where it suddenly became apparent that hmm, when we wake up and smell the coffee I think it's going to be a longer, um, a longer time than we thought. Part of her job was to ensure that the families of the miners who were out on strike were looked after in the best possible way that we could. It cost me a lot of money. It cost my wife, my kids, not a lot of money for me to be on strike. I think it was £15 a week the miner's wife would get, but the miner wasn't to get nothing. Thatcher had deemed that the trade union should pay strike pay. Trade unions didn't have that. Where, where would we have got that money? Well, I think the um, amount of money that we've been getting and the amount of children we've got now, so it's been a very hard struggle. And people that should realise this, if you've got a family now, they know what a struggle it can be. When you get your family allowance, there's no way that you can go out and buy a joint for children. You look round and kids want things, and that's the hurting point. When your children want, and you just haven't got it. I went off on maternity leave just about the beginning of the strike as well. So that was quite a worrying time because I wasn't sure how long it was going to go on and how we were going to provide. So there was a fair bit of stress and I think you cope at the time and it was maybe a wee bit later on when the bills started coming in and it was just a nightmare. And of course the benefits agency at that time didn't tell us about a lot of the benefits we were entitled to. All I, all I do is feed my kids and have my money for my electric. I'm not bothered about paying anybody. They can't have what I haven't got. I was part of the committee that was organising collections throughout the area between here and Adewell, Logan Lee, Stonyburn, Breach, West Calder, Paul Beth, and we, we would hit a, a different village every week. And that went on for the duration of the strike. I'm talking about uh, Communist Party members, Labour Party members, Young Socialists, uh, Young Scottish Nationalists. Oh, it was a brilliant uh, unity in action, shall we say. It was tough. It was really tough. And it would be tougher for a lot of people who didn't have family support. They'd be fathers and sons, so that, you know they wouldn't be able to support each other uh, financially because different generations would be in the same position. So strike centres were absolutely crucial to keep your morale up. For some, their principal sustenance is now the soup kitchen. It's staffed by miners' wives and run on ingenuity and generosity. The soup kitchen brought families together too. And I think this all steadied the resolve that we already had. It went unnoticed by a lot of people just how much work the women and the children actually put in to help us to ensure that we stayed steady. Meanwhile, the Miners' Food Fund in Scotland was boosted today by £27,000. Edinburgh's Lord Provost, John Mackay, handed over three cheques to representatives of SOGAT, who were backing the appeal, and Miners' Wives from Dalkeith Strike Centre. There was a general uh, support from the NUM for women's involvement, probably initially because the practical um, aspect to you know feeding people and ensuring that families were uh, looked after. You've also got to remember that you have 6,000 other women in the Scottish coal fields that could be involved in the women's support groups. Those women were then becoming active, going and speaking um, at factories where the trade unionists telling them how it really was and what the experience was like and raising considerable amounts of money to support not only the soup kitchens but also the campaign. Bring your women all together to one area. Supposing you can only send one or two delegates for each area. All come together, have certain subjects to talk about, discuss the subjects, think about how we're going to plan them out and what the way forward does to get these plans into action. Women played a, a, quite a significant role, I think, uh, in support of their men and knowing full well what the, their men were fighting for. And I think the women seen that and there's no way the media could use the women to break that straight because it was the exact opposite. But I want to get through there, through there, to stand in the picket line and they'll not let us because they see brutality through there. A lot of women did go on pickets 
it wasn't a very safe place often, but um, it wasn't safe for men either, you know, but it was, it was a good experience for some women to see what it was like to do that. So I was elected as the secretary of this Central Strike Committee. Part of my duties were organising pickets, mass pickets, uh, liaising with the head office in Edinburgh, ensuring that we had participation in demonstrations, rallies, picketing. A busload went from this area, going down to Nottingham to participate in a mass picket. Stopped on the motorway. Where he's going? We're going to Blackpool for a seaside trip. He's are on the wrong road, turn the bus and go back. We were being denied the right to access where we wanted to go to in our own country. You had soldiers, you had police. They were all acting there on behalf of the government. When you take the right shots and watch them, watch the policemen. I seen them booting a boy there and your camera never took a sight of you. So you're bad. Over the years, any, any struggle I've been involved in, the media never uh, takes the side of the workers and struggle, it's always on the side of the bosses. I mean, that's part of the, 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 the game. I mean, but I think what came across in the 84, 85 strike, right, the, the, the viciousness, you know, just the media, but the, the, the government. Miners' leader Arthur Scargill, wearing his baseball hat, was in their midst, and the police didn't like it. Scargill's presence is always provocative. He knows that, everybody knows that. When he arrives, uh, people get excited. I'd rather he kept away. I still have a resentment to this day about the sun, and it was lions led by donkeys. And it was a cartoon of Arthur Scargill's head on a donkey's body. And these kind of attacks that made the miners more determined that we were going to fight on. Because they didn't portray the truthful facts of what the strike was about. They turned it into the circus of Scargo versus Thatcher. And that wasn't what the issue was about. The issue, as I've said, and I'll say it to my dying day, was the issue of jobs. The issue of the miners' future. We're not fighting for a bus sale. We could get what it done, it's the money. It's the young boys we are fighting for. It's them that's wanting jobs. But the police has got us strangled. It doesn't matter what move we make. If you leave the tune, they're there. Nobody could turn around and say that the miners were unjustified in what we were fighting for. Any worker, I'm quite sure, would have done the same. For the first time at Bilston Glen, handcuffs were used to restrain struggling pickets. I was dragged from the picket line, T-shirt torn from my body, body hair torn out, carried through cordons of police, blows coming to all parts of my body. I was detained for six hours or something, charged with breach of the peace. My wee mate was in the next cell to us. His wife, she was due to have a baby any time that day. On my release, later that night, my mate who was in the next cell to me, saying to me, Wally, could you do me a favour? Could you phone when you get out and let Margaret know that I'm still locked up? That guy's wife, like I say, she gave birth later that day to her first of the family. It was quite an outstanding achievement of the NUM to keep the solidarity that they did keep because you were bearing in mind a year-long struggle like they did was a, a hell of a burden to put in people. The strain of it, not just the financial strain, but all the other pressures that were put on miners was, was horrendous. I, I feel that was, the structure that was put into place by the union was quite important because it was about getting information out to people. And there was fights, you know, 
disagreements in the strike centres and about tactics and things, but at the end of the day, people pulled together because it was loyalty and um, there was a sense that we had to be in this together because our backs really were against the wall. I'm not saying that um, I ever said to my husband, get back to your work, because I wouldn't have done that, but I did wish for it to end. 11,000 have been arrested, 7,000 injured, four of our members have been killed on picket lines, and seven have died in incidents associated with a dispute. Towards the end of the strike, probably running up to Christmas, the pressure was unbelievable on families. And we got a lot of international aid and that was great and it did boost us emotionally and, and morally. You know, you get support from countries that you would normally think are, should be the recipients of aid. Asian communities, French miners, German miners, Russian miners, they were all there to support the British miners. I think Christmas time was a make or break time for a lot of people. I remember one of the women who came to the strike centre sent in a poem and it wasn't until later on we discovered that her husband had actually gone back to work. But the poem was basically saying how is she going to explain to her children that there's no Santa for them when their children, their babies, when they're four and five, seven years old, how do you explain to a child at that age whose next door neighbours are getting bikes, how they get nothing? You know, and I think these kind of real human um, pressures were, re were real for people. Signs that Scotland's defiance was evaporating were evident at dawn. Two pits called off their pickets and ordered a full return. Even in the militant area of fight, the buses entered the pit gates without a picket in sight. But sadly, as the strike progressed, more and more people did go back to work. But I still maintain to this day that the majority of British miners stayed in strike right to the end. Whoever went back to work didn't take that decision lightly because they knew mm. what was going to happen afterwards. There was a lot of people still not spoken to in communities. There was bitter divisions when the strike came to a conclusion. There were people who, because of the bitterness that had been generated throughout the strike towards the establishment, wanted to continue, genuinely wanted to continue and genuinely believed that they could go on and win the struggle. Protest at the stand being taken by the coal board's director in Scotland. Then you had rifts in families because people went back to work, rifts in communities because there was people who went back to work, um, walking about the street and other people, you know, feeling angry and betrayed. If anything, the lessons that have got to be learned is that for one thing, the miners held their dignity. We held our respect and we held the respect of the other trade union movements throughout Britain and indeed countries abroad. Trade union movement is still here and they've never destroyed the trade union movement until such time as the, there's a more equal distribution of the world in the world. I believe there'll be turmoil until this is fixed. And whether that's socialism, whether it's whatever it is to get a more, more equal distribution is, is all important to the general well-being of humanity as a whole. At the end of the strike in Cowden Beath, the men's committee got plaques and all the women that had served on the committee we were invited up and we were given a plaque and it had a miner's badge, NNUM badge on it, and it had Here We Go on it and your name printed on it. 
and it was really, couldn't believe it, you know, a lot of the women were just thinking, but, you know, we didn't want reward for what we've done because we did it because we wanted to. The women marched with their men, marching behind pipers back to the pit they last entered a year ago. It's now threatened with closure. And leading the procession were six miners who've been sacked. They were left at the pit gates as the others entered. And I can remember on the day that the miners went back to work. I think it was a year and a day from the day we went to strike. Meeting in the roadway leading up to Pokemic Pit. And the miners walked back into work where heads held high. I remember how I felt on the day that the strike was over. It was awful, just that feeling of, oh God, it's all, it's all been for nothing. And then when it was announced, eh, I remember phoning Margie, the woman who was on the committee with me. We met and we entered into the pit gates as a procession, an organised workforce. And I remember the general public supporters of the miners standing at the sides of the road. One particular very good comrade of mine, elderly woman, Morag Purnell, and the tears were streaming down her face as she watched the miners come back to work. She ran over and gave me a big hug. And there was about five minutes silence. We could not say a word to each other because you just, the power of that decision was so destroying, you know. Although it was hard, when it did come to the end, you're trying to make sense of it all and trying to say, well, what has it all been for? And feeling really crushed. I proceeded to go to my work that particular day with tears in my eyes and a lot of memories. Bitter, but also some happy memories something I'll never ever forget till the very day I die. And I just hope, I hope that the people of Britain will never forget what happened during that minor strike.